Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Ultraspeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's one 450 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I'm your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour. is another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. Chaz starts us off in New York. Hey, Chaz, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah, how's it going? Uh, you know, to be completely honest with you, Chaz, I've been, whoa, 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 whoa. I have been better. I, uh, it, I came down with, uh, I'm calling it the plague of death. Uh, I'm not sure what the technical name for whatever it is I have, but um, that's what I'm calling it. Well, I mean, at least plague isn't as bad as it was back in the Middle Ages when you think about it. Well, that's true. That's true. How can we help tonight? Uh, well, I had to do some major triage of my own on my uh, Linux gaming rig this weekend, and I got it all figured out, but it took a lot more effort than I normally would have devoted to it. I usually would have just reinstalled Ubuntu altogether if I had the level of problems that I had this weekend because it's free and it takes me very little time to get it back to a state of being up and running. The reason I didn't is because I'm using a storage arrangement that you and I have discussed in a previous episode in that the OS is on an M.2 drive, and I have an LVM set up comprised of three 500-gigabyte SSDs where I store the native Linux ports and the games that can be run via Proton. Great idea. And And the reason that I didn't just reinstall Ubuntu when I started having the problems I was having was I didn't know if wiping out the OS that created the LVM also wiped out the LVM. I think that the LVM would persist because when I loaded up a live environment of Ubuntu, it seemed like it still recognized those drives as one, one and a half terabyte drive. But I didn't know for sure, and I definitely didn't want to go through the hassle of recreating it and subsequently downloading Bioshock Infinite and Doom and other 50 gigabyte plus games. Sure. Again. So do you know if... uh, do you have the answer to my question, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. LVM will persist through any... Ins- it, it will not only persist through Ubuntu reinstalls, Chaz, it will re- it'll persist through any reinstall, even if you were to jump distros. So I have taken Ubuntu servers that had LVM, and I have put CentOS on them, and you can import that LVM volume no problem. That's one of the advantages of LVM is it is a it's a dynamic system that allows for change around it without being affected. And Red Hat did a very good job uh, when they implemented LVM, making sure that it was designed in such a way that you could essentially nuke everything around LVM and still have that volume exist. That's one of the reasons that it's my go-to standard anytime I throw a production server up. If it's on Linux, since we're not, if, my, if I had my choice between LVM and ZFS, I'd probably go ZFS. But since I, I'm still not personally comfortable with ZFS on top of Linux, if I have my choice, I'm using XFS on an LVM volume. Okay, that certainly makes it easy, especially given the fact that it is eventually going to be April 2020 and my Ubuntu install is going to need a fresh coat of paint. But what I ended up doing for this weekend was I had to install the Ubuntu desktop uh, over top of regular Ubuntu and uninstall GNOME entirely, which is not the worst solution in the world, but it would take a long time to explain why I had to do that. And uh, it's just good to know that I can replace it with standard Ubuntu because I'm not Joe Reffington, and therefore XFCE isn't always my jam. Right. Yeah, of course. Although, in Joe's defense, let me tell you something. I re- Actually, you may have heard that we had a little bit of a flub with the music, and the reason we had a flub with the music is because we re-imaged that machine that we use for that controls the studio this week, and we're still ironing out the, the wrinkles in it. And one of the th- one of the changes that we made, actually, is we went from GNOME to XFC, and that was on the recommendation uh, from the people at Rivendell. Fred Gleason told me straight up, XFC is a better environment for rock-solid reliability, and he's run into issues with GNOME if the machine has to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have a graphical user interface. 
So if you have a server and you need that thing to be up 24 seven, I actually, my go-to standard now is, is XFC. Now, truth be told, the amount of servers that I have with graphical interfaces, I, this would be like the only one. And it's not even really a server. It's a server OS that I use as a desktop. So anyway, take that for what it's worth. Thanks for the call, Chaz. I pre Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be sure to keep you apprised of how my continued proton testing goes. Yeah, please. I iron out all these kinks. Yeah, please let me know. one 450 no That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Now, my next guest, he's actually going to join me as a co-host this episode. Uh, we are talking about Google and their initiative to launch a game streaming service. They're calling it Stata, uh, and essentially what they what this is, is what's what Stadia is is a game streaming service that it was recently in closed beta. It's now come out. Games really, if you think about it, to play a video game, you need two things to the actual user. You need solid low latency 1080p graphic uh, video, and you need a X Y Z input from the user. Now the XYZ input, that's very easy to transverse the internet in a low latency kind of way. And we've gotten pretty good at doing that with video. And so you need a bunch of other components, a bunch of graphics cards, a bunch of computing power, a bunch of network resources in order for the rest of the game to function. But the actual interface with the user, with the player, just needs that 1080p low latency stream and XY input. And Google has come out this week and announced and said, hey, we are going to build a platform on top of Linux. And so if you want to play a game and stream it over the internet, we're going to let you do that with the Stadia, the Stadia platform that we're launching. And you can build your game for Stadia, but you're going to have to build that game to run well on Linux. And I, as I often do, anytime somebody chooses Linux, hit the moon and got very excited. And then I realized that I am the least qual most qualified person to really discuss gaming. I can talk about the server and the hardware and the requirements and all the cool things that Google is doing from a technical perspective till I'm blue in the face. But as far as the actual gaming perspective and the and the and what this means for the Linux gaming community, that's not my cup of tea. Now, fortunately, I do another show every week called Destination Linux with a friend of mine, Das Geek, also known as Ryan, who is a gaming expert. I mean, this guy knows more about gaming than the people at Steam who make the games. And so I... I looked him up, I said, hey, Ryan, would you be able to stop by in the Ask Noah show and chat with us about Stadia? And he said, yeah, I'd love to. So joining us on the program, Ryan, also known as Das Geek, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I love being on here. Sorry you're feeling sick. Hope you feel better soon. Yeah, I, me too. I, I'm hoping that it's like a three-day thing, and this would be day two, so by tomorrow I'll be over it. So, See, if, you're, if you were a gamer, though, and you were sick, you would just be using this as an excuse to play more games. So exactly. We'll get you there eventually. Exactly. We're working on it, slowly but surely. So I, I guess, let me ask you this, Ryan. Uh, just flat out, is this a good thing for Linux, or is this a bad thing for privacy? Wow, that's a tough question, because it's a little bit of both. I think ultimately for Linux, it's a good thing. You've got a streaming service that's extremely powerful, running on, obviously, the back of Linux here, allowing up to 4K, 60 frames per second, HDR, surround sound, all the things that you want in a gaming platform here running through a server, and the ability to, of course, play it through any browser, uh, or if you want to play it on your TV by having a Chromecast connected to it, is a pretty big advantage and now a lot of games triple a games that we wouldn't have had access to typically or we would get them later uh will have access to just by having a browser so you could play this on your tablet you could play this on your linux computer you could play this on your tv it's kind of all the range uh across the board of devices that you can play this on which is really cool but google is known for not being very privacy friendly. So obviously having a Chromecast in, they talked about Google Assistant being on this thing. We know Google Assistant, you know, listens, it records, you, um, you're going to have your mic hooked up to it. It's going to have your contacts. So there, there's the privacy section of this certainly is a concern because it's Google, uh, but certainly the technology portion of it is fascinating, at least with what they're showing. But they're not the first ones to do this kind of service either. So it will be interesting if they can pull off 
exactly what they're saying they can do here. So I'm sure, assuming you're referring to Sony's service, but Sony's service is specific to the console, right? You have to have one of their consoles to play it, whereas Google just requires a Chrome web browser. That's correct. This is the first implementation, really, where the only thing you need is just a browser, uh, unless, of course, you're doing it on TV where you need a Chromecast. But, you know, I don't expect Microsoft, of course, has their version of this coming out eventually. And um, I don't expect Sony to kind of take this laying down or the others. They also have a lot more experience in gaming. And Google, unfortunately, has a tendency to abandon projects if they don't take off right away. With that said, I think Google has a strategy here more so to go after Twitch than anybody else. Uh, they've been wildly outgunned by Amazon and their platform for YouTube gaming has not been nearly as pop popular. So I think from a strategy standpoint, they're going straight after Twitch. And they, you can see that in a lot of their media is about going after game streamers and being able to play with the community, which is a really cool uh, aspect of this as well. You could you could sit there and you know play a game and then you know have people in the community join in live or some of the features that they were demonstrating. So I think they're going after Twitch. I think they're going after the console market, and I think the Linux folks could take advantage of this from the pure aspect of those of us that game. We can now get in there and play some AAA games uh, out there. And of course, it's using AMD GPUs, and you know how I love AMD here. Um, so they're, they're utilizing a lot of cool technology. AMD GPUs and the controller that they have are some of the most, some of the some very exciting pieces of the hardware puzzle. I want to get to that in just a moment. Ryan, are you okay taking a call? Absolutely. 855-450-NOAA. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Chris, Ohio, you're on Ask Noah. Hello. Hey, Noah, how are you doing tonight? Excellent, sir. How can we help? So I am uh, moving in the next month. I bought a new house and setting up a new network. And I want to basically set up everything with new equipment. And wanted to go, want to know your ideas on how I go about that. Uh, just a little bit of detail. Uh, it's going to be a duplex. I own both halves of it. My son's going to live on the other side, so I want to set up uh, networking so both sides can share off my uh, free NAS system. Sure. Ryan, what are your thoughts? What are your go-to for Wi-Fi? As far as the equipment that we'd use for Wi-Fi, you know, I've had a terrible experience recently in this new house with Wi-Fi equipment. So I'm probably really? not the best here. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I lived in a three-story log cabin before and had a great experience with a Netgear Nighthawk with, that I was utilizing, and it seemed to reach through all of it. But uh, in this house, which is not as big as the prior house, I've had nothing but issues, and I think a lot of it just has to do with the structure of the home. Um, I've tried the recent uh, offerings from Netgear, like the Orbi, et cetera, but right now I've been looking into what I'm guessing you're going to suggest, which is ubiquity. Yeah, I am. I, I, and, and frankly, I just had such good luck with ubiquity. Now, the truth of the matter is that ubiquity was really created more as an enterprise solution, right? But the truth of the matter is what works in the enterprise can work in the house, uh, sometimes you just pay a little bit more for it. In the case of Ubiquity, they are such a budget-focused brand to begin with, and I don't say budget in the way of Kmart. I say budget in the way of you get a really good value for uh, for a low dollar amount. So to put this into perspective for you, a Cisco or Ruckus access point that would have comparable throughput and comparable features and comparable management to my beloved Ubiquity system would cost you somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500 per access point. Now that a, a, a comparable Unify access point is going to set you back about 150 bucks, and they're going to include the PoE controller. And guess what? You don't have, or, uh, sorry, not controller. They're going to include the PoE power adapter. And as far as it comes to the controller with Ubiquity or Cisco, you're going to have to purchase a controller with Ubiquity. Guess what? That software runs on any Ubuntu box, so you can just spin that up on a VM. If you don't like the concept of a VM, they do offer a small 90, like $75, or $80 essentially ARM-based controller that you can purchase and plug into your network and run. And full disclosure, we have a very large Unify controller, a, a dedicated server actually, that runs our Unify controller for the hundreds and hundreds of sites that we have that we manage networks for. In my house, I actually have one of those, what they call the cloud key, the small little ARM-based controller, because I like the idea of all of the infrastructure being under my roof and under my control and on my land. I don't want anything traversing the internet. I don't need something going out to the internet to set the SSID or set the password. I don't need those packets coming and going from my network. 
Um, and so I prefer to have that all in house. But you could absolutely rent a DigitalOcean VM or you know or, or go that route. Now there's actually there's one other option for you. If that seems too daunting to you and you say I just don't want the management infrastructure, they do allow you to provision the access points with just an app on your phone. But I wouldn't recommend going that route because anytime you reset your phone or redo your phone, I'm not sure there's a way to back those settings up. I think you'd have to start fresh again if you put a new thing on the app. And the again, the controller software being free and running on Linux. I see no reason not to actually spin up a controller and run that. But I can assure you, we have put those access points in places where Wi-Fi has no business and God himself didn't want to see uh, Wi-Fi. You know, we have buildings that have three, four uh, foot thick concrete walls. And we put the, the UAP AC Pros, is the particular model I'm fond of, uh, and we put those things in and they will cut through anything. And so you can purchase one. I live in a 4,000 square foot house. One access point covers the entire house. Now, I actually purchased two, but it wasn't because I needed the additional Wi-Fi coverage. It's I wanted one to play with. So if I want to try something new, I try it on my second access point that I can configure for a new network or I can configure for a, a, one of the things I'm testing right now is creating a separate network for Internet of Things. And it's a, it's a separate VLAN network that only can talk to the Internet. And that's what I'm putting my Internet of Things stuff on so I can start to play with some of that stuff without actually exposing any of my personal infrastructure. Is that answer help you, Chris? Uh, yeah. Can you tell me again what the model was you were talking about? Yeah, you bet. It is the Ubiquiti model. Yep. It is the Ubiquiti UAP AC Pro. And we'll have a link for you in the show notes of podcast.asnoahshow.com. So after the episode, you can check it out and there'll be a link to purchase one uh, right there. There, I just looked it up on Amazon. They are 135 bucks. The only thing you have to pay a little bit of attention to Sometimes the sellers on Amazon will include the PoE injectors. Sometimes they won't, and so you have to. And what they do is they essentially sell it to you as a, as a uh, at a discount if they don't include the injector. So the one I'm looking at looks like it's $135 and does include the injector. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that. Now, as far as are you set as far as routers go, or do we should we talk about that a little bit? No, I was looking for. Yeah, let's talk about a router too, because um, that's definitely part of the thing. Like I said, it's I. The one I have is an old trend net. I've had it for like five years now. I'm like, when I move, it's time to get, let, let's get a new one in there. So if you're just, if you just have some basic network requirements, like I just want the internet to work and I want to forward some ports, but for the most part, I just want the internet to work. If that's you, if that describes you, Ubiquity does make a router and it is called the USG or Unified Security Gateway and they run about $130. Here's why I don't like the USG and don't have a single one in, well, I own one, but I, I don't have it in production. It's just there for testing and so I can get familiar with it. First of all, it also gets adopted into the controller. And the reason I don't like that is the last thing I need is for my wife to tell me that, uh, that I, she needs a port opened up or we have to do something or restart something or whatever. And I have to tell her, I'm sorry, honey, I can't make that change for you right now because the controller crashed and I can't make any changes to the, the router. The access point, I probably set the SSID up I set the, the, the password up and it, it pretty much stays that way for all time because to change the SSID means I got to go reconfigure a bunch of devices anyway. So I, I don't really make a lot of changes to the Wi-Fi network, but my gosh, my router, it's pretty much three times a day. I'm in there monkeying with something and trying something new out or making a new firewall rule or checking on traffic or whatever. I don't want that kind of piece of critical infrastructure tied to that has to have a computer to run essentially to make it work. Um, now, some of the higher models, they do offer the ability to log into them with the web interface, but then you start getting into three, 400 bucks. And I, I just don't see the value there for that kind of money. Uh, so what I tend to use is uh, the Microtech routers and Microtech is a company that essentially got their start making uh, routers for ISPs. And so they're heavily used by WISPs, heavily used by cable internet. Uh, you can purchase the, an entry level Microtech for about 50 bucks. It's called the hex 750. And I'll have a link for that in the show notes for you as well. Um, if you, here's the nice thing about Microtech, you can purchase this router for fifty-two dollars, and you can, and it's it 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 can be a little daunting the first time you log into their web interface because it is a complete enterprise grade router. It can do everything. Now you can start by just clicking on DHCP tables and managing your IP addresses and what you want it to assign and those kinds of things. Managing some DNS if you want to do that. And then uh, go into the firewall and create some holes. Uh, you can just stick with those few menus. And a lot of people never advance beyond that. And that's perfectly fine. But the nice thing is, Microtech makes three, four, five thousand dollar routers that are designed to be used for giant ISPs. 
And the interface and the software that runs on these three, four, five thousand dollar routers is the exact same software that runs on this fifty three dollar box. So the advantage to me as an IT company is I give these to every employee that works for us. If they have if they have an internet connection, I tell them take one from the shop, take it home, use it because they get to practice and learn on enterprise grade equipment, and you'll never outgrow it. You might outgrow the hardware, and so you may need to upgrade and and go to like the RB twenty eleven for example is a one U uh, unit that we have in production with thousands and thousands of users. I've never seen a company outgrow one of those. Uh, so you might you might grow past the fifty dollar box and go to the hundred dollar box, but the software is exactly the same when you do. And so for that reason, I would put Microtech in the same level as Cisco. Uh, and, and so for, th- for those reasons, because they're so inexpensive and because the value is so high, I, that's what I tend to recommend for routers. Um, but there's a lot of people that say, if I'm buying the Unify Access Point, man, I'd just rather have it all in one place. I'd, ever, I'd rather have all one brand. I'd rather have everything look the same. I'd rather have to be able to create the firewall rules in the same place that I create my, my networks. And if I create a VLAN, it's nice because I don't have to create it in two places. I just create it in the controller. And that change goes out to the Access Point and the router. Uh, you know, it's, it's six to one, half dozen to the other. I, there's no wrong choice. Uh, it's it comes down to personal preference, and I, I I think I've explained why my personal preference leans the way it does. Right. All right. Thanks for the call, man. Well, that is outstanding. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Check the show notes. We'll have links for you there. Podcast dot com. Phone line to be a part of the program. It is eight fifty five four fifty Noah. It's one eight five five four five zero six six two four. The email live at ask <laughs> the email live at ask Noah show dot com. My guest this hour is Ryan, also known as Das Geek. You can find him on YouTube, youtube.com slash Das Geek. He's got reviews of all sorts of crazy stuff, and uh, a true Linux nerd really dove in uh, headfirst and has become one of my favorite people to chat with about Linux. He's joining us this, uh, this hour to talk about uh, uh, this new program from Google called Stadia that allows you to stream games to your Linux box or any box using just a Chrome browser. Now, Ryan, one of the things that piqued my interest, in addition to the fact that uh, it, well, because it runs on Chrome, you can run this on anything. So they have a demonstration of this running on a Chromebook, which has zero GPU acceleration. Correct. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating what they were showing there. And they were showing it seamlessly switching within seconds between the devices there. So it's not like a situation where you've got to shut one down and boot the other one up and wait for the game to load. It looked pretty seamless what they were showing on stage. They have uh, they have currently have implemented 4K. They are looking to implement 8K down the road. So they're building for the future. The ability, to, for me anyway, the ability to run this on a phone or a tablet or a Chromebook means to me that this opens gaming to a wide swath of people that might not ordinarily participate. You and I have had conversations off air about building a new gaming rig for myself. Mm-hmm. And if I did that, I would probably participate in more games. What if I didn't have to build the gaming rig? What if I just paid my, I don't know, 25 bucks a month or whatever it's going to cost and had access to that game and I could just open my web browser and play it. No installing, no waiting for downloads, no waiting. I mean, we just, I took a call at the very beginning of the hour and the guy's talking about an LVM volume where he's got a, a bunch of game data. What if I didn't have to download anything if I just clicked on a button and within five seconds, and that's about the time it takes to load a game inside of a Chrome browser, about five seconds, that game loads inside of a Chrome browser and the players launched into the game. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating idea. And it almost, I know you have a Switch, a Nintendo Switch, and almost brings that Nintendo Switch idea to a whole new level because now you don't need the hardware, like you said, and the Switch you can bring anywhere, but now you have that anywhere with you at all times, your phone, your tablet, things that you carry around with you. I, I'm struggling and I'm hopeful that they're able to produce what they're showing on stage. You know, the internet connection out there is for 4K is generally the ratio of acceptables around 25 megabytes per second. Plus, you got to have pretty good upload because you're going to be sending data back and forth here. So it's going to be interesting on the technology that they've used to pull this off. Now, I know they're utilizing all the hardware acceleration is being done on the server side. They're utilizing a custom made AMD GPU, but I'm guessing it's likely based off the Radeon M50 derivatives out there uh, because they were talking about 10.7 teraflops, um, which is ridiculous. If you compare that to something like a PS4 console, console you're looking at like six teraflops. So they're, 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 they're putting serious power behind this to be able to produce very high quality 
gaming from any device through a browser. Where I struggle is I'm guessing that you're still going to have throttles, a bottleneck with your internet connection. And it almost reminded me, I thought back on the 56K days where I'd be playing a game and my parents would have to tell me, get off the internet so we can make a call or get on the internet ourselves or whatnot. Like it's going to completely, I would think, consume your internet bandwidth while you're utilizing it. Uh, at the same time, if they're able to pull off what they're demonstrating there, it would be a completely new feat in technology that uh, nobody else has pulled off to this point. Th these are some of the things that I don't understand because I'm not as heavily involved in the gaming community as you are. How important is 4K to gamers? Is that something that a lot of them are just going to say, listen, if it doesn't support K, I'm out? Or do most people game in 1080p? Uh, I think the gamer... Right now, the perfect gamer preference is 1440p. Uh, some people game at 4K, and we'll talk about it being great. But in general, when you're gaming on a PC, you're looking to console gamers look at 60 frames per second. That's what they want to get. That was the kind of milestone that they finally hit by releasing the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One uh, X and to get to that 60 frames per second. But PCs, we've been there forever. In fact, we're well above that, as you know, in some of the videos that I do on the Radeon 7 GPU, I'm running two, 300 plus frames per second. Now there is a point, while they're not exact, that your monitor hurts. Let's say you have a monitor at 144 hertz and you're running at 400 frames per second. You're not really getting anything more, any more smooth. But the idea behind it is if you have a monitor that can handle it, very high-end monitor, and you have a GPU that can push it, you're going to have higher performance, smoother gameplay, which will allow you in a competitive, which we're not talking about because I'm not a competitive gamer, nor are you, but those who are competitive or professional, they're looking for that sweet smoothness of those additional frames per second. But having 4K and 8K, I think, is just kind of showing off what they're capable of doing here. And they're obviously going after your casual gamers as well, who are going to want to play this on their TV. And if you got a 4K TV, you're not going to want a bunch of black bars around it or have to go and zoom in on it. You're going to want to play it at that full resolution. And you're going to be able to do that here, just like you could on a PlayStation or an Xbox One. Let's talk about the controller for a second. So one of the things that you are pointing out over and over and over again is latency is key here. We have to have low latency video. We have to have low latency input. And Google has come up with some innovative ways to make this work. Instead of having the controller plugged in or paired via Bluetooth to the computer, which is what I would have expected them to do, what they're actually doing is they the controller exists as its own independent device on a Wi-Fi network and communicates directly with the game, thereby reducing the late. Because now we're not going from the controller to the machine out of the machine into the internet and to the game. We're just going straight from the controller to the game. So they are able to significantly cut down by latency. That is a That seems like an innovative approach, but it also means that you have to purchase their game controller if you want to connect that way. And that seems like that's a slippery slope. Yeah, you start, they, they're obviously going to have a lot of equipment. I think that they're going to have to pair with this. Like I, I started with, I think they are going after streamers here. And I think they're going specifically after Twitch because that's just been a huge loss for them. They've not been able to compete in that market. And Twitch is serving tens of thousands of ads every second. And I'm sure Google's just drooling over that. So you, when you think about a streamer, though, you have things like the controllers obviously now this device allows you to use keyboard and mouse um, you can hook up to it you can also use your existing controllers through bluetooth but you're absolutely correct the advantage of utilizing their controller specifically is the latency and being on wi-fi and also cross compatibility easily to move it between devices that allows there but i would imagine if you're going after the streaming community you also have things like the camera that you're going to want because people like to see the streamers that are streaming and you're going to want to see your friends playing like you can do on computer. So they're going to have some camera accessories. Probably they'll be selling here as well as other accessories like microphones and things. Maybe it's as uh, simple as uh, a Yeti that somehow interfaces with the Chromecast or something like that. So I imagine we're going to see a lot more accessories filing so, on here. So talking about accessories and, and interfacing into the community, one of the things that they are launching with this, which I've not seen in any other platform, is the share state ability. And this is the ability to share what they call a playable moment with an encoded link to either one person or thousands. And so the idea is, I, I, and again, I, this is coming from the perspective of a non-gamer, but I am in Counter-Strike and I have a absolute righteous kill in Counter-Strike. I mean, this is the coolest shot ever, and I don't think anybody <laughs> ever could make that shot. 
and I tell my buddy, hey, this was the coolest shot I've ever made. And so I, I, I hit the share button and I can share that playable moment with my friend. And then he gets inserted into where I was and then he can play that moment. Do I understand that feature correctly? Well, the, the sharing feature or capabilities of it is one aspect. You got that right. So this is not something actually unique. It's something that PlayStation and Xbox has where you get this great no scope kill on DOS Geek. You want to show all your friends, hey, I'm not a gamer and I completely wiped them out. So you can basically on PlayStation and other consoles hit the clip button and that will grab, you know, prior one minute and plus, you know, whatever you want to grab. And you can usually edit that within the screen and then send it out to YouTube or to all of your friends and your contact list and they can watch that. There's also the ability which you were talking about where you could be a streamer and or be playing with your friends and kind of be like, hey, I'm tired or I've got to go get a drink. And you can pause and your friends can come in and basically take over where you left off and start playing from that point, which is also a very very cool feature so the the uh the share state it it doesn't allow somebody necessarily to replay it's just allows essentially a video of what happened it's not necessarily they are the player do i is that is that what i'm under my corrected that's, understanding that's what i understood but you maybe they did create a feature that allows that i didn't see that uh, myself but uh, my understanding was it was kind of two separate things one you would clip and one is you could stop and take over but i would imagine if you're talking about something being able to stop and play it would have to be a single player game because obviously they couldn't replay that moment in a multiplayer right. game scenario so sure if that was the case it would probably be like a single player hey this is my favorite part in the game where i keep dying and then you know you could send that spot to your friend and maybe they could uh, give you some tips and tricks so the second part of that what you were talking about is the is essentially the other component of this which is the essentially the assist part right so you get stuck on a level you have the ability to ask a friend hey i'm stuck on this level and then they can you can send a game link to them they can pick up your game get you through that part or whatever and then go back now, they actually have a tie-in with Google Assistant. And this is, I think this was the point, because I was watching the presentation today, and I think this is the point where I started to get very concerned. Um, because we are, this is the point where it dawned on me that we are going from a really cool service that fundamentally enables people to play games on Linux to a service in which we are remoting into a box and handing over control to a company who literally makes its money from harvesting data. And essentially what they want you to do is use the Google Assistant to say, hey, I need some help. I need to know how to get through this level or what to do here. Or I'm stuck, which to be frank, I'm a little torn because as a person who doesn't game a lot, that's me pretty much every game, right? That's you in the tutorial sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. Anytime I hear Google launching something, I have you know, mixed feelings because Google just, they just don't have a great reputation anymore when it comes to privacy at all. And more control over what we say, being in big ISPs hands, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential negatives here for this. For instance, even people that we know, um, not that we know personally, but that we've heard of in the news and things, big personalities that have certain political stances or whatnot, getting banned off platforms, the, the, you know, now you've got a company who's done this before with their play store through YouTube, who now has control over gaming and who can stream and who can't. And maybe you start streaming and they find out, you know, they don't like what you say and you get banned and lose all your games. I mean, there's a lot of negatives here that went through my head, just being, um, you know, playing devil's advocate here at the same time, the futurist in me, the technology lover uh, was sitting here drooling a little bit over what they've accomplished, but it will be interesting for me to see what other companies that maybe have a better track record of privacy come out with. Cause I don't think you're going to see people uh, like Microsoft or Sony who have a history of, you know, being in gaming. They have a lot of relationships with a lot of game studios sitting on their hands and just allowing Google to kind of take over here. So I think we're going to have a lot of competition and we're going to see a lot of neat things. Google Assistant was the particular part for me as well, though, back to your original point that I said, uh oh, I'm not so fond of that because right. these, I, this idea of things just listening to you or listening into your house and conversations and things like that, I would imagine it's one of those things that's always on kind of uh, how they would set it up. The, I guess the million dollar question, probably what everybody wants to know is, is this going to lead to more games on Linux? Because the my initial inclination was, you know, when I read that quote, you if you're going to make games and you want them to run well, 
on our platform, then you're essentially going to have to make them run well in Linux. I thought, well, it's a no brainer. I mean, why would they go through the trouble of publishing all this code and testing all this code and putting all this code out there and not make it playable in Linux? Of course, they're going to make it playable in Linux. But the truth is they did a beta with Assassin's Creed Origins and that to this day still doesn't have a Linux version and Ubisoft, the manufacturer of the game, says it's not coming. Yeah, I, I think that this is good from a game. I, I highly doubt that we're going to see more IPs just porting their game natively to Linux. I think what you're going to see is IPs porting their games to be compatible with these type of streaming services. From a gamer's perspective, I'm at a little bit of a crossroads with it because, you know, for instance, in my Radeon 7 review, a $600 $700 video card. There was a point when I was gaming early on when I was a kid that a game console and a PC, there was no comparison at all. It looked like two different worlds when you're playing on a console versus a PC. Nowadays, even with a $700 video card, you don't really get to see that performance as much. And the reason is all the game developers want their games to have the biggest market potential possible. So they make their game so it'll work on the Sony PlayStation 4, they make the game so it'll play on Xbox, and they make the game so it'll play on PC. So they don't throw in all of the graphics uh, potential or performance potential that you could get in a PC. They may throw a little bit extra, but they're not spending a whole lot of time there. The big thing is just being cross-compatible. Uh, so when you come to a service like this, you've got a big name behind it, Google. They're going to be pushing for, obviously, game developers to develop within their platform. And I think there's going to have to be, based on limitations of bandwidth in most cities that are out there, you know, some limitations on what they're throwing across to get some of the performance at 60 frames per second that they're talking about here. So you're us as, you know, purist gamers are not going are, are not as thrilled about the idea that a lot of developers are going to be making their games a little bit more minimal so that they can compete on these streaming services like that, at least initially until internet service and things catch up. Um, but at the same time, I think that we will have the ability as Linux gamers for the first time to go see a new Doom game, for instance, it's one of the games they announced, and be a uh, Doom Eternal and be able to play it on day one because you could open up your Chrome, Chrome browser and just start playing it. And that's an experience that we've not had in Linux gaming. Now, it's never been better to be in Linux, and Linux gaming has never been better than it is today. And it's an amazing asset because as somebody who started in Linux uh, not so long ago, and most of my community that supports me are brand new to Linux, and they are gamers, and they're a younger generation. They want the gaming. For the first time ever, it's so easy to convince people to come to Linux because of things like Steam Proton. This is another feather in that cap. So if it gets more people understanding Linux and thereby understanding privacy and security, then it could be a win. Ryan, a.k.a. Das Geek on YouTube, youtube.com slash dot geek, or visit his website, dosgeekcommunity.com. Probably one of the most informative channels on YouTube. If you care about Linux reviews and want to see how it works with hardware, particularly hardware that isn't uh, the go-to standard, i.e. the green hardware, and you'd like to learn about the red, uh, head over to youtube.com slash dosgeek. And before I let you go, Ryan, uh, tell me about the North Georgia Linux coffee meetup, because that is a really cool event. Yeah, so I just started this event and it's just been an absolute blast. And what we do is we get together in, in Georgia. If you're in North Georgia area or are willing to drive, uh, we meet around the ball ground area at a coffee house that uh, serves their coffee from aged whiskey barrels. I mean, what's not to love there? And so you, we sit down, we have some coffee, and generally I try to set up a project. Um, and we do this uh, the second week of every month. But you can go to the Dosky community webpage to get the uh, next session for it. And we sit down. We'll, I'll generally bring a project like a Raspberry Pi or something else to work on for us. And we just sit and talk about Linux and network. Um, people were handing out their resumes last time for individuals who you know are looking for work um, or just talking about what the latest desktop environment or distro that they're using. All skill levels are welcome. It doesn't matter if you've never used Linux before, you're just interested or you're a veteran in it, um, just come down and hang out with us, enjoy some coffee. And we also have Bo Weaver on, which you've had on the show. He comes every session with me, and he's just an awesome individual to learn from as a professional hacker. I mean, it's just a blast to pick his brain. Completely agree with you. We've had Bo on the program, and he is one smart guy. Uh, in fact, those some of you may be in the, in the know, 
uh, know that, that he may become a more a regular part of this program very soon. So we're, that'll be excited to see. But Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. If you want more of Ryan, you can get him on Destination Linux every Sunday where him and I do a show together along with some other guy and then uh, our friend Zeb. And, no, I'm just kidding. Michael Tanel. <laughs> Michael Tanel. The joke is we always have to throw Michael Tanel under the, the bus. But uh, no, right. the four of us, we do, we do a show on Sunday, so you can check that out at Destination Linux uh, or YouTube.com slash DOS Geek. And Ryan, thanks again for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, you bet. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. We're late to the Linux Newswire newsroom with Eric, the IT guy. Here he is. And nothing. Here he is. From the Linux Newswire studio, this is the Weekly Roundup with Eric, the IT guy. Hey, Noah. Happy to be with you again. And here are your Linux and open source headlines. Friends of the show, Linux Academy turned seven years old this week. Founded in 2012 by Anthony James, Linux Academy is an online learning platform for all things cloud, Linux, DevOps, and keeps growing. Originally started as a class for 50 students to learn Linux, now boasts a subscriber base of over 300,000. The platform has evolved over the years from a fort short video series and published how-tos, and now provides cloud-based servers, hands-on lav, interactive diagrams, and certification training tracks. New and updated content is launched every single month. Happy birthday to Linux Academy. The Mozilla Foundation has released another new privacy and security tool called Firefox Send. Built under the test pilot program, Mozilla has graduated the tool to general use. Send.firefox.com is a free file transfer service that provides for easy transfers over encrypted channels. By following a quick wizard, you can send 1 gig files or 2.5 gigabytes with a Firefox account, and the end user doesn't need to sign up for an account at all. If end -to end encryption wasn't enough, a limited number of downloads and a password can be added to shared files. According to a blog post on Mozilla's website, they acknowledge there are multiple cloud file sharing options available, but that Send was a continuation of their manifesto to put security and privacy first in all of their tools. Feral Interactive makes the news this week with a new release of Game Mode. Feral has long given priority to Linux gaming development, and as an example of that dedication, they have been iterating on their open source gaming performance tool. Version 1.3, released on GitHub this week, added a number of great features. By enabling Game Mode, the user can disable the screensaver, increase I.O. priority of the game process, and now they have released a helper script, Game Mode Run, to make similar changes to games which don't natively support gaming mode. Also in this release is beta support for overclocking AMD and NVIDIA graphics cards. They promise to continue developing the application, promising, quote, more cool things to come now that some foundations have been laid. Finally this week, Atlassian is shelling out $166 million to acquire Agile Craft. Atlassian, known for their project and issue tracking software Jira and wiki application Confluence, continue to expand their offerings to help drive digital transformations across the development management landscape. Agile Craft, which already integrated well with it into Atlassian's applications, as the name implies, helps projects plan around Agile methodology. However, the application also supports other planning frameworks like Safe and Less. It can pull information in tools like Jira, Microsoft's Team Foundation Server, and IBM's RTC. This latest acquisition will join with the company's other purchases, including OpsGenie and Trello. For LinuxNewsWire.com, I am Eric the IT Guy. Now, Noah, back to you. Thanks, Eric. I Actually, I want to dig into that Firefox Send thing for a little bit. So the interesting thing about Firefox Send is, like Eric mentioned, they use end-to-end -end encryption, and that's, that's a step in the right direction. But the things that appeal to me, security controls when you go to upload this file, expiration date for the link, the number of downloads, an optional password, those kinds of things are features that everybody, I think, expects from Dropbox and Google Drive and whatever else people use to to essentially solve this problem, it was probably not something I expected to get for free and not from a company that I trust as much as Mozilla. The they have two versions of Firefox. And so the first version is the one gigabit one gigabyte rather version that you can use quickly with no account. So you don't have to sign up for anything. You just go to send.firefox.com, upload a file, and you can send this thing. The second version is a 2.5 gigabyte sign-up version where you can sign up for a free account and then you're able to send files uh, up to 2.5 gigabytes. Now, there are a couple of other competitors. Obviously, Dropbox is one. Obviously, Google Drive is one. Uh, Kapavik in the chat room points out that Nextcloud is one. 
I use C file for this. And the reason that I use C file for this is because I'm already using C file to store all of my, uh, all of my work data. And so if there's anything in those files that's being C filed around, if C filed is a word, if it's not, I'm going to coin it. My, my work files are being C filed around at any point in time. If I want to send one of those files to somebody else, I can log into the C file web UI. I can click on the file I want, generate a link and send that link to somebody. And now I don't have to do anything. I don't have to wait for a file to upload. I don't have to wait for, I don't have to wait for, you know, a, a UI to load. None of that because my files are already syncing around my C file server. And of course it's under my control. I host it. I own it. So I don't have to worry about data privacy breaches. And I've had better luck with uh, file syncing for large files anyway than I've had with Nextcloud. But Nextcloud certainly would be an option. The issue though, for me is I don't understand why this is not getting more positive press because Mozilla is solving an issue that I feel like IT administrators have been struggling with for years. How many times as an IT administrator have you had to send a QuickBooks file to a client or back? How many times as an IT administrator have you had to move a PST file from one place to another? Now, truth be told, those oftentimes well exceed 2.5 gigabytes. But the point is, we all the time have data that we have to move from one place to the other. And there has not been an easy, convenient way to do that that doesn't involve giving up your privacy. Dropbox shares the private key with every, essentially th with themselves. So they use one private key to encrypt all the data. So they'll tell you that the data is encrypted. But the truth is, the data is encrypted by them and can be decrypted by them upon their choice. They used to say only you had access to the data. They have since changed that on their website to now say that you're the only one with permission to access your data, but they have the ultimate God key, if you will. So that leaves you with places like Google drive or Microsoft OneDrive, or you, you know, shoehorning this solution into something like a backup service like Tarsnap. And none of those are easy and quick solutions. And a lot of them cost money. Now I would like to see Mozilla take this further. I would like to Mozilla to, I would like to see Mozilla, set up a service for $4 a month or $5 a month. They'll give you up to 25 gigabytes to send. Keep in mind, they don't have to store that data indefinitely. So it's not the pricing model can be drastically lower than a, a Google Drive or a Dropbox because that data isn't persistent. Heck, I would be okay if it was $2 a month or $3 a month. I'd be okay with a 24-hour link or a 48-hour link if I could do up to 50 gigs or something like that. Because there are times, as I mentioned, PST files where it often exceeds even the limits that they have now. And I would like to see Mozilla take that step. I would like to see Firefox Send become the de facto standard for moving files across the internet with ease. I would like to see this integrated into, into Mozilla products. How great would it be inside of a Firefox browser if you had a little icon that you could drag a file over the icon? The icon then generates a link, a Firefox Send link. You take that link and you send it to somebody and now they can download that file. How awesome would it be if this was integrated into Mozilla Thunderbird? And when you go to send an attachment, and you go to attach that file and Mozilla Thunderbird can be programmatically told, hey, attachments above this size are not going to pass through my SEMPTI server. So at this point, anytime a file attachment is handed to you that's larger than this size, what I want you to do is I want you to pass that off to Firefox Send and upload it to them. How great would that be? And I think Mozilla has latched on to solve a problem that nobody else is really tackling. Google Drive isn't really meant for sending files to one another. People use it. They integrated that feature. But Google Drive is really designed for you to store all your data on Google so they have access to it. Microsoft OneDrive is designed for collaboration. It's not really designed for sending files from one place to the other. And this is obvious by the fact that you have to log in through a convoluted uh, you know, web UI to get the files uploaded into the client before you can actually send it. And I think Firefox Send fixes all of that. Again, the phone lines are open, 855-450-NOAA. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. The Jetson Nano, this is a $99 mini AI computer. It's a competitor to the Raspberry Pi. And the idea is NVIDIA wants to create a Raspberry Pi competitor that can test and experiment with AI. So the Jetson Nano comes with four gigabytes of RAM versus the Raspberry Pi's one gigabyte of RAM. It has a quad-core ARM A57 1.43 gigahertz processor and a 128 CUDA Core NVIDIA Maxwell chip. The operating system can run off of a micro SD. It's powered by micro USB, but, and here's where you can tell they are thinking ahead with this. They've also included a barrel connector that you can connect to a more powerful power supply unit 
that will allow you to do more intensive operations. Now, the downside to this device is it doesn't include any Wi-Fi, it doesn't include any Bluetooth. And so you're limited to hardwired connections or a Wi-Fi dongle. But you have to understand that Wi-Fi dongle compatibility with the operating systems that are going to work on a device like this are probably limited. I don't find that to be so much of a limitation because quite honestly with you, I'm not purchasing a device like this to be used in the same place I would use Raspberry Pis. If I had something I wanted to use a Raspberry Pi for, I would just use a Raspberry Pi. It's a less expensive option, and they have essentially tailored it to be a mini laptop inside of a small chip form factor. This has a different purpose. I see this as having a different purpose. I see the purpose of this as being able to test AI and play with AI. Things like OpenPost, things like Tiny YOLO. You can run artificial intelligence platforms on it, and, and, and if you're doing that, or if you're trying to do... Uh, video encoding or decoding, which is one of the things that NVIDIA says that you can do with this because it's such a powerful device, you're probably not pushing that data in and out of the device over a Wi-Fi connection anyway. So a wired connection makes sense. You're essentially treating this like a server. But this is a cool little device. I, I would love to pick one of these up. I'd love to play with it. I would love to tell you guys what I think about it. And uh, if you if you pick one up, please email me, live at asknoahshow.com. I would love to know what you think about this device. Android desktop mode has become a thing. This comes from us to, from androidauthority.com. In Android Q, there is now what they're calling a desktop mode. And you go into Android Q developer preview, and it enables you to connect external peripherals to your Android device and use your Android device as if it was a desktop. No, what do you mean when you say use my Android device like it's a desktop? What I mean is you get a cursor on the screen. All of the icons are no longer on the quote unquote desktop. They go down into a drawer and you have window capability. So you can resize windows and this, that, and the other. Now there's a pretty convoluted way to actually get this enabled. And of course, we'll have the link for you in the show notes of podcast.asknoahshow.com. So if this is something you'd like to try, uh, you'll have to follow the guide to enable the, the, uh, the desktop preview mode. But don't, Kid yourself. This is the direction that mobile computing is going. This is what Samsung is trying to do with DeX on Linux. This is what Microsoft attempted to do. Quite frankly, this was the promise of Ubuntu Touch. And this is where mobile phones are eventually going to lead. I can't tell you how many enterprise corporate environments I go into nowadays. And the primary computing device is a phone or a tablet. I watch a CEO of a major company uh, where we had to have a discussion and we had to find him an Android based SIP phone because he wasn't comfortable using the traditional desktop phone. He wanted it to function like his smartphone. I've had similar conversations with people in high level positions where they want a large tablet to use as their primary computing device. They want to put into a desk, you know, mount type of a thing. They want a keyboard and mouse, but they want that thing to run Android because that's what they're comfortable with. So don't kid yourself, this is the next evolution of that, to turn our phones into desktops. Now the question is, will Google get there first or will Linux on Dex get there first? I'm inclined to think Linux on Dex is going to get there first. And here's why. Linux fundamentally has a lot of technical advantages for making this work right out of the box. Linux is designed to be small in nature and then scaled up. Now in the case of Android desktop mode, they don't need to necessarily scale Android down any. But they're also shoehorning a operating system that was never designed to run as a desktop environment to run as a desktop environment. Whereas Linux was designed to run on embedded devices or desktops. We've designed both. And so we have that flexibility and that capability. And for those reasons, I think that we're going to get there first. Hey, if this stuff interests you guys, I want, I want to invite you to check out our YouTube channel. We'll have a link to you in the show notes. We are launching a YouTube channel specifically for Linux-based video content. I have heard from you over and over and over again. Probably the number one most consistent piece of feedback I've gotten since launching this show two years ago was, I wish you had a video element, Noah, because video incorporates the 85% of communication that is nonverbal. And I understand that, and I respect that. And I want to deliver on that to you, the audience. However, it doesn't fit with the style of show that we have here. And I'm not in the studio like this week. I, it, it's not always possible for me to, to do video. 
And uh, but so the way we're going to do that is it will be less frequent. It won't be a like a weekly show or anything like that. But we're going to release video content as it becomes available. And the video that we released this week is absolutely fantastic. Probably the, my favorite video I've ever released. Facebook has what they call the Open Compute Project. And this is the idea that each rack inside, uh, each rack unit inside of a rack does a specific thing. So maybe one rack unit does storage, maybe one does graphics, maybe one does processing, maybe one does power supply. And the entire rack itself is energized with 12 volts. And so any every device that clips into the rack then is powered from the rack itself. So this creates for a much more efficient rack, and it also means that it can be infinitely configurable. Now, the great thing about the Open Compute Project, it's open. So the specs are published in a PDF document. Board schematics are published in a PDF document. And you can download that PDF document, and you can build this in your home if you want to. So we asked Facebook for the last four years if we could come film this, and Facebook said no each and every time. This year, I refused to take no for an answer. So I walked up to Facebook, and I said, Facebook, I would like to film your very cool Open Compute Rack. And they said no. And I said... Okay, if you can't go on camera and explain your open computer rack, can my producer William and I go on camera and explain your open computer rack? And Facebook said, okay. So we spent two and a half hours having Facebook explain their open computer rack to us, and then we explained it on camera. And that video is available on YouTube. We'll have a link for you in the show notes. Again, probably one of my favorite videos I've ever shot. Up and coming, we're going to have a review of the sixth generation X1 ThinkPad Carbon. It's one of the most exciting computers to run Linux on the market. It is what Google is using. And so we thought it would be prudent to give you a review of that unit. Also coming up, a updated tutorial on using a YubiKey for PAV authentication into SSH. So you take this YubiKey and you can use it to authenticate into all of your SSH servers. It's an easy and convenient way to SSH into tens or 20 or hundreds of computers without having to individually manage each one of those servers. And we're going to give you a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to get that to work. We're also going to include some new features that weren't in the original tutorial, if you didn't catch that. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. I apologize for my voice. It's a little crackly today as I'm kind of fighting off some illness. I'll uh, make sure to get better by next week, which is when the Ask Noah Show continues. It's next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. Huge thanks to Ben, our producer, Sarah, our call screener. This hour of the show may be over, but there's plenty more content for you 24-7. AskNoahShow.com. <laughs>